And How close did you get? To the craft? To the craft. Roughly 200 meters, 150, 200. At one point, they said they were going to smoke us. They could throw us out of a helicopter. They could. It's very easy to get lost in the jungle out here. You know, they kept saying stuff like that. The craft itself was like an octagonal shape where you could see points. It had a pyramid structure on top that was black, and you can see the shadowing of it as it rotated. You crest this hill. Yep. You look down into into the valley. Yep. And there's a clearing. There's a clearing. With a UAP. Yes. Just sitting there. Sitting there hovering. rotating clockwise, yep. And that's in transition, this color spectrum I was telling you too. And that's why it's kind of it's something that stuck out. It's not a building, you know. It's not something that you're used to seeing. Maybe topside it could have looked like a building or something that, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I don't have that perspective. I wasn't a pilot or anything, but... I can tell you from our point of view, it's something that just it looked very unnatural and abnormal. And that's what got our curiosity to go investigate this. Now, normally because we, had, we would have had comms, you're damn right, we'd have called it in. Report something suspicious. Maybe get some eyes on a helo, get a hold of their call signs and try to do them fly around, and they never did. And obviously we didn't have comms to do it, but they were more occupied with what was going on behind us. So when we trekked down and got around 150 to 200 meters, from it, you know, and this is an opening. By the way, um, there's no tactical advantage being in this situation because you don't have cover. It's jungle. You have concealment, but this kind of concealment with vegetation is not bulletproof. Mm -hmm. So when we trekked up close and we were attack calm, so obviously you have points here, right, at each Marine. So you have visuals of the sides. Somebody has point and somebody has the rear. And all of a sudden, we we're involved by this military force of, I still to this day don't know who they are. And How close did you get? To the craft? To the craft. Roughly 200 meters, 150, 200. How, did you get to the bottom of the hill? Yes. So you could see, so you saw the top of it, and then you could see underneath of it. And underneath Maybe. of it had this platform that was on the ground that was separate from this craft hovering. And it was, it was very weird to see, and I was like, okay, I don't know if that's kind of like a cement pad or something. I don't know if it was like a helo pad or anything like that at first, but then started seeing how the material would kind of look very similar to what the craft was. It's like, well, that's separate. So you have something that's on the ground stationary, and then you have something that's up top and it's just rotating in a clockwise position. So right when we got close to it, um, at least, you know, 150, 200 meters out, then all of a sudden we were engaged, at least not in a hostile manner, at least, you know, not gunfire or firefight or anything like that. But the way that these guys moved was so fluid, it was so still, it was very, very, very smooth. And it kind of indicated to me, um, after thinking about it for several years, is that these guys have done it for a, a while because of how smooth this operation was. Mm -hmm. So when we were in a tactical column going towards the center of this thing, they actually came from the flanks, but it was more of a diagonal, like a corner of the room, so to speak, right? For them, at a tactical advantage, they have interlocking fields of fire on every single person, and they had a team of eight, right? And the gear that they had was black OTV vests. They had black camouflage utilities. They so had, what you're saying is there was there would have been no Mexican. They were professionals. Yes, there would have been no yes. Mexican standoff where no. if they fired, they're shooting into their other squad. They had they, they had perfect angles. Yes, they did. To where both sides could engage you. Yes, team of four, team to. of four. So it was like a fire team element without worrying about a blue on blue no. situation. Exactly. Okay. So um, you know, with that being said. Because as they, as they approached us, you hear the f safeties flip off. Now, your attention to detail, when you're seeing this kind of stuff, your sensors are very heightened, so you can pick up. I know you being a combat veteran, you know, you know all about that. Your heightened sense of awareness is going through uh, astronomical changes. To Hypervigilant. A, yes. So you can hear stuff a lot clearer. And that's when you kind of picked up the hum that this object was doing along with these guys flipping their safeties off, especially M4s. You know, it's very distinct sound. Anybody in this room who's held M4s and has shot them, M16s, things like that, it's very distinct sound to flipping it off. So um, we kind of knew, and they started yelling at us. You know, they were like, you know, you're not supposed to fucking be here. What the fuck are you guys doing here? Who the fuck are you with? You know, so they knew they were using the kind of lingo that we, we were using too, especially in the military. So it made me think that at some point these guys actually were uniform military at one point. Any accents? Uh, not accents. It's just like American dialects, how you and I are talking. Uh, very, you know, they, at one point they said they were going to smoke us. They could throw us out of a helicopter. They could. It's very easy to get lost in the jungle out here. You know, they kept saying stuff like that. So after they enveloped us, they all pretty much got in line. They told us to put our weapons, so we all got in line as well. And we had our hands up. We had our weapons slung. And... Um, they're having two guys watch while there's a guy basically taking our magazines out of our vest. 
and they're throwing them on a deck and they're kicking them away so we don't have time to react. They also, at the same time, the first thing they did was obviously take our weapon and clear it. But they took the magazine out and they actually held it in a way to where they could pull a charging handle and collect the round and have it not hit the deck. So they, the, the way that these guys operate was very smooth. It's very calculated, very precise. You could tell they've done this a lot or they've rehearsed it a lot. You know, especially combat operations, you're doing terrain model rehearsals, you're doing rehearsals whether you're clearing rooms, trying to figure all that kind of stuff out. These guys kind of did the same thing, I'm assuming, because of how smooth it was. And because you know as well as I do, you get, you know, you have new guys that join a unit and they're not that fresh. You know, they're very choppy because they have the basic understanding mm -hmm. of either how to stack up and do room clearing. Um, and the guys that have done it and been through combat deployments and all that, they're very kind of methodical, very smooth because they know what to expect. These new guys, it's not the same thing. You could tell these guys were seasoned. So as they did that, they actually, um, each Marine had two guys on them, plus one that was taking the stuff off of them. They actually knew where our military IDs were because in Marine Corps order, you have to have them in your left breast pocket. So there were 15 of these guys, three on each Marine. No, no. So they had other guys right here, and they had three that were just going through each Marine. Okay. While other people were holding each Marine at gunpoint. And they're not like... Um, they're not like super close to us range wise with, uh, you know, because if you get a muzzle close, I mean, it's easy to grab mm -hmm. it and, you know, kind of fend off, especially with a rifle. But these guys were off at a standoff distance that even if you try to move, they could, they could, they could smoke you. One search team of three guys. Yes. And then the rest of the squad was aimed in. Yes. On you. Hold. Okay. Yeah. So, and again, you know, they're not anywhere where they could actually, there was people behind us because obviously if they had to engage, they're going to hit one of their own guys probably. So it was more like they were kind of the, moving the same way through all of us, all six of us, okay. taking our stuff, taking uh, pictures of our military IDs, you know. So they had like these devices that kind of looked like a very thin, it looked like a smartphone modern day right now because in 2009 it wasn't the case. I think the most high tech thing they had at that time were maybe Blackberries, but they're bulky at that point with the yeah. ball. And then they had their flip foam razors and things like that. But these look like something you'd see today. And they were taking pictures of military IDs and they had something, some other device that was like a, uh, remind me of a bat system. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Describe it. It's like a biometrics tracking system. So what it does is when you come across with an insurgent, you can take pictures of their face, okay. their retinas, I know what you're fingerprints. Talking about. Yeah. Something like that, but they were trying to have a they were trying to scan their IDs with this thing and it wasn't working. So they're kind of getting frustrated with it. So as this is going on, did they collect biometrics from you? No. Okay. No. Which I'm, I mean they took pictures of us, but that might be enough and then they took our IDs, you know, because some people I talked to that are in the special operations community with that, they said, "Yeah, we have the ability to scan IDs and it tells us everything about you." Military IDs, driver license, things like that. So it's very high speed stuff. I mean, and considering this was in 2009 compared to now, I mean, of course, they had this thing that they were using to load up stuff. It's very advanced physics, you know, something hovering off the ground, not making any sound, but an audible hum, like a, a guitar amp or something that's like a, a transformer. So it wasn't like, it didn't sound like a jet. No. It didn't sound like a helicopter. Hell no. There was no engine noise. Nope. Just a hum. Just an audible hum. Very, it's very creepy to see because it's not normal. Was it like a bassy hum? Yeah, yep, okay. like a guitar. Like if you were to unplug it, I mean, it wasn't the same pitch, but it was like the same, same kind of sound, same kind yeah. of noise that it emitted. And um, so as they're searching us, we're watching this thing happen. And that's when we started seeing trucks come from our left and go onto this platform. And they were up armored 350s. I know exactly what 350s are. They were kind of beefier trucks. They were matte black. When they were coming at us and they go left, and I was glancing between what was going on in front of us with these guys and then all of a sudden glancing over to what was going on behind them. And that's when I started seeing the key details of this thing. Like it had like a scale pattern on it, kind of like an octagonal, because this craft itself was like an octagonal shape where you could see points. It had a pyramid structure on top that was black and you can see the shadowing of it as it rotated. But it was rotating very slow. And then every, it had like these vents on every single corner on the middle part of these platforms, on this, uh, the panels anyway, there was like a Vanta black. It was like a dark black that would like absorb light. Very weird. Very. What, what do you mean by that? A dark black that would absorb light. So if you ever familiar with the BMW, they painted Vanta black. It was like a very super dark black. It's not like a reflective material at the all. The matte black? Yeah, but very, okay. very, very, even darker than matte black. Okay. Like you can shine a light at it and it won't even illuminate. Like the Batmobile. Kind of. Okay. Something like that. But even, it was like very dark. The only way I can describe it was like that Vanta black. Okay. And um, 
So, so as, you, when you mean absorb light, you're saying if I shine a laser on it, you probably you might not even see the laser, correct. or it would be very dull. Correct. Okay. Something like that. So we're watching these vehicles, right? These trucks. Now the thing I would say on the front of them, because you know hum, um, Humvees, the military has, they have the IR lights on the front near the headlights that you can drive at nighttime with your knots. So they had the same thing because they had the same kind of slits that had the IR lights. But they had uh, weapon cases in the back of each truck bed. And, you know, you could store like a couple hundred weapons, maybe a hundred weapons, maybe a platoon, a company size element. And um, it was the same Pelican cases that we would use to store stuff when they were transporting, you know. So very big cases on two of them in each truck bed. And then they had a shipping container thing. I mean, it looked like a shipping container, but smaller and half the size. And the thing that was different about this is I had a cylinder on the front of it that was towards the truck. It was like parallel to the ground, just a cylinder right on the top of this thing. And uh, for years I thought, okay, you know, like it's got to be oxygen supplier or like a vacuum sealing thing that you would, you know, because obviously I'm thinking it's drugs. I was like, okay, so this is a very advanced way to do that, just years of thinking of this. And um, come to find out, when I gave my speech in D.C. on that Saturday for the disclosure project with Dr. Greer, um, he's got a lot of people coming out of the work, woodwork, by the way. And this gentleman, I'm not going to give any detail. I know a little bit about him, but he works in some of these projects at a very, um, some very controversial facilities. He's aware of what was going on. After I gave my presentation of this, he confirmed, he says, no, he's like, I don't want to leave Michael hanging out there, but I was not expecting to come and talk to you about this. And he went explaining what the operations do, why they do it, and what they were using them for. And he says, there's not drugs that they're putting in these shipping containers. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.